Let's talk about temptation this morning. I don't know if uh, you use that word a lot, but in James chapter 1, he's going to talk and he's going to warn us uh, about temptation. When we use the word temptation, look at the screen. Here's what I usually think about. Uh, something like, somebody says to you, can I tempt you with some dessert? You ever had anybody say that to you? Or you, you just finished a wonderful meal, you're eating out, and the waiter or a waitress comes up to you and, and they say something like, did you leave room for dessert? Can I tempt you with one of these desserts? Or we respond with something like this. That's really tempting. That sounds tempting. And so we use that, that term all the time. Mae West, who lived a number of years ago, used to say something like this. I generally avoid temptation unless I can't resist it. <laughs> and usually the world is kind of thinking that way. Um, it's more lighthearted. But today what I want to do is I want you to see from James chapter 1 the, the serious side of temptation for him and, and what the Lord is kind of warning us in that sense. James chapter 1, verses actually 2 on up to 18, he starts out, he, he transitions. He moves from this external problem that you have to an internal problem that we can have. So he moves from the external to the internal. Let me put it on the screen this way. He moves from the external to the internal, from testing to tempting. You see, he starts out with, uh, my brothers, count it all joy when you are facing trials of any kind, when you're tested. And if you endure those trials, you'll receive the, you know, your endurance and patience and wisdom. So he's talking about these external things, these trials you face on the outside. Then he moves at about verse 13 to some internal problems. The internal problems are temptations. So it goes testing on the outside and tempting on the inside. And he's warning you, hey, you can be tempted. This trial is on the outside, this trial is on the inside. Testing is, can be on the outside. Tempting is going to uh, be what your heart conceives and thinks on the, on the inside. We say it this way at faith. Satan tempts us. Why? Why does he tempt us? Because he's always wanting to bring out the worst. So in your kids or in my life or in your life, he's going to tempt us and he's going to want to bring out the worst in us. But we say God tests us. We know from Scripture that God never tempts us. God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man. So he's not going to tempt us to do wrong, but he's going to test us. He tested Abraham, remember? Abraham, do you love me more or do you love your son more? Would you offer Isaac? And so he, when he gets to that point, he says, oh, you don't have to. Now I know you love me. I just wanted to know. I wanted to test you told me you love me. I just wanted to give you a way to show that. Thanks. For, you know, I know you love me now. So we say Satan tempts us to bring out the worst. God tests us to do what? To bring out the best. He wants to see you at your very best. Here's the text for today, verses 12 to 18. <clears throat> a man who endures trials is blessed because when he passes the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. No one undergoing a trial should say, I'm being tempted by God. For God is not tempted by evil, and he himself doesn't tempt anyone. Is that a good promise? But each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desires. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. Do not be deceived, my dearly loved brothers. Every generous act and every perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of lights, 
with him there is no variation or shadow cast by turning. By his own choice, does he catch that? Now he's moving from this temptation to the very fact that God has chosen. He's reaching out and he's saying, I, I wanted to reach people. I wanted to save people. It wasn't us running around saying, we're going to find God. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. So God says, by his own choice, he gave us a new birth by the message of truth so that we would be the first fruits of his creation. So he kind of ends his section off that way. But through that section, he's talking about we're going to be tempted. So let me put this on the screen. Here's kind of the sermon in a sentence. Scripture warns us that, that we can be tempted. Now, unless you're dead, the reason you need to hear this, unless you're dead, you're going to be tempted this week. And you were tempted last week. And you're going to be tempted two weeks from now. And you're going to continue to be tempted the rest of your life. And when we say we do not sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth isn't in us. We're going to be tempted. But let me show you what's unique about this, this kind of temptation that he's talking about here. Let me take you back and give you verses 2, 12, 13, and 14 so you can kind of see this in its context. Verse 2, consider it a great joy, my brothers, whenever you experience various trials. See the word trials there? The word trials in verse 2 and the, verse, the word trials in verse 12 is the same word for temptation in 13 and 14. Let me highlight it. Six times he uses the same Greek word. The first couple of times he uses them as nouns, their trials as a noun. The other four times he's using them as verbs that say, I, I, I'm tempted to do this. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. But it's the same Greek word. And actually there's a seventh time that it is used as well in verse 13. You see it says there, no one undergoing trials. You should say he's tempted by God. And then the next line of verse 13, for God is not tempted by evil. It's actually the seventh time that that same Greek word is used, only at that time there's an alpha in front of it. So it means it's not tempted. And we use that all the time. Um, in A person's a theist. He believes in God. If he's an atheist, you put that alpha in front of it, it means he doesn't believe in his God. If he's a Gnostic, he means you can know things. If he's an agnostic, he says, ah, you can't know. And so in this sense, they just put the alpha in front of it and said, God cannot be tempted with evil. So all these times, so tell me, how are trials the same as temptation? It's the same word. Here's how they're the same as temptation at times. When you have problems in your life and you call out to God and you ask him to solve that trial in your life, and for some reason, God doesn't intervene. Or he doesn't appear to intervene. And Satan comes at you and says, see, I told you, God doesn't care. Oh, I told you, God can't do anything. And you're tempted at times to go, why am I even doing this? And that trial can also become a temptation to your heart and life. And so what he's saying again is this. Look, you, he's going to warn you, you are going to be tempted this week. And I just want to warn you so that you don't fall away and have these major problems. And in this text, he uses four uh, Greek words to describe this kind of temptation, this kind of testing that you're going to have. And again, why do you need to know this? Because you're going to face it this week. And I want you to see the total devastation that you can have if you yield to that temptation. First Greek word that he uses in this text to describe... Uh, our temptation, is the Greek word exelko, and it means to be drawn away. Exelko. Let me show it to you in the text. No one undergoing a trial should say, I am being tempted by God, for God is not tempted by evil, and he himself doesn't tempt anyone. <clears throat> Do you see that on the screen? Let me ask you this. I can probably hear somebody saying, wait a minute, Jesus was tempted, wasn't he? Was Jesus not tempted in the wilderness? Isn't Jesus God? So what does he mean by, for God is not tempted by evil? 
Wasn't he tempted by evil? Hey, go up to the, go up in the top here, bow down and worship me, and I'll give you everything out there. I can hear Jesus saying to him, Satan, everything is already mine. What are you going to give me that I don't already have? Didn't he create everything? Didn't he make everything? But Satan comes at him and says, oh, let me just kind of deceive you, thinking you're going to get something that you don't already have. Jesus already had it. But wasn't he tempted? So what's this verse mean? For God is not tempted by evil. When he was tempted in Matthew 4. I'll tell you what it means here in a second, but let me just show you. Matthew 4, 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be what? Tempted. Was he tempted to do good? No, he was tempted to bow down and worship Satan. That's not a good thing. And he says, oh, you don't touch the Lord your God. So, uh, and there's another one. Let me give you one in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest, talking about Jesus, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tested in every way as we are, yet without sin. He was tested or tempted like us. So what do they mean in the text when God cannot be tempted by evil? He was tempted in the wilderness, was he not? But here's what it means. There was nothing in him that could respond to that sin. That He didn't go, when you're tempted by sin, you go, oh, that looks pretty good. Oh, no, she looks pretty fine. I can hear some guy making a comment like this. Oh, God put all the molecules in the right place with her. Because there's something in us guys that resonates. We got a sin nature that resonates with us. But Jesus doesn't have a sin nature. So let me illustrate it this way. If I had a magnet up here, and I had nails... You know, there's steel nails. And, and I put that magnet over those nails. What would those nails do to the magnet? It would, they would just be jumping right up at it, wouldn't it? Yeah, especially if it was strong enough. If I could take that same magnet, listen to me, if I could take that same magnet and put it on a copper tube, what would it do? Absolutely nothing. Because there's nothing in that copper tube that's going to be attracted to that magnet. The same is a picture of Jesus. For you and me, we're like the nails. And the sin comes along and it goes, <laughs> and we want that. And, and Jesus is, is like that copper too. And sin comes and Jesus goes, what are you talking about? What do you mean you're going to give me the world? It's already mine. What do you mean you're going to you know, do this for me? I, I can already do this. And there's nothing in him that's attracted to sin. So when it uses this phrase that he's been tested, he has. Sin came at him, and Jesus goes, no response. Nothing in him is attracted to sin. Even though he was tested, Satan brought all the sin he could at him. He was and so you can't say to Jesus, well, you, don't, you, don't, you weren't tested. like You didn't live down here like I do. You didn't have some good-looking woman in front of you. You didn't have this. You didn't have this money. You didn't have this chance. Jesus said, none of that attracts me. I don't have anything in me because I don't have a sin nature that is drawn to that. The text goes on, uh, verse 14, but each person is tempted when he is what? Drawn away. Remember the Greek word? I'll put it down here on the screen, exelco. When you're drawn away. You know what Satan wants to do with your life and mine? He wants, especially, to destroy you and your family and your marriage and your kids, your grandkids. He wants to draw them away. And how is this picture used in terms of us today? Let me look at these kids right over here with mom and dad. He wants to say... I, I, I want to draw you away from your parents who have such wise advice to give you. And I want to draw you away from your church friends that can keep you close and they can hold you accountable. And I want to draw you 
so that you are away from the God that you're so in love with and that people who would hold you accountable, I want to draw you away so that I can get at you and destroy you. How does this passage talk about the end? He wants to draw you away and he wants to entice you. And he says, when sin hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth, what's the next word? Death. He said, I want to destroy you. But I want to draw you out to do that. Here's the Greek word on the screen, exelko. Let me slide it apart. There's a little prefix, ek and helko. Here's the, the two uh, parts that are used to that. Ex, we use it all the time in this word, exit. And it's the same Greek words that we, we have there. It's uh, epsilon and exi, and it's our ex. And there's an exit over there, and there's an exit over there. And what's an exit? On the screen, it means how to get what? How to get out. Here's an exit. So the first part of this word meaning out. The second part of the word, see that rough breathing mark over the, what looks like an E, it's the epsilon in Greek. The rough breathing mark puts a little H in front of the word. And it's helco. That word means to draw. And I don't mean, uh, I got a pad and paper here and I'm going to draw a picture. That's not what it means. It means, hey, can I, hey, psst, hey, psst, over here. Let me draw you. Let me pull you away. Come here. This would really be great. And I want to draw you away from what would be otherwise good to be something bad. When you put these two together, it looks like this, to draw out. And so what you are really wanting to do, this is a hunting term, and it means, look, I want to take the animal that's otherwise safe, I want to draw it out so I can kill it. And... All sorts, we have game preserves everywhere in the United States. We had one in Indiana. Uh, and you know in those, in those game refuge areas, game preserves, they have all the food they need. And did you know this? No hunter can enter that area. And so the hunters, when they go hunting around the game preserve, where are they? Yeah, I need to be cautious here, right? There, you, you, we said in the past there are two things that people don't talk about, religion and politics. There are really three things they don't talk about, religion, politics, and hunting. Because <laughs> you're going to kill Bambi? Oh, how do you do that? And, and they forget that when they eat the hamburger over lunch, you know, somebody walked out with a 22 and shot the steer in the head and you know, and butchered it or took the chicken that you have that chicken sandwich and, you know, do those kind of things. This is a hunting term. And he says, I want to draw you out. So around the game preserve, you know what happens? Hunters actually, you know, are, are outside the hunting area just waiting for the deer or whatever's in there. Come out, come out, wherever you are. You know, the, the hunters there drooling. Oh, look at that buck in there. Oh, look at it. might look something like this. Oh, come, come, come out. And they're in this game preserve. By the way, that buck on the screen uh, is about five to uh, six years old. Look at you can tell that from the points on the, the antlers of it. And so did you know bucks, that kind of deer, well, they'll, they'll stay way back, uh, unless they're in a game preserve, they can wander around, they just kind of look at you and, ha ha, I'm here, I got all the food I need, and you can't come in, you can't shoot me. Matter of fact, if, a, if they come out of the game preserve and you shoot them, and they run back into the game preserve, you have to go get the game warden to go back in and get it. And he will look for the trail of where that deer went back in there to make sure that you didn't shoot it back in there. So this animal, this buck, bucks never want to come out. You know the only, uh, when you're in deer season, does are out there playing in front of you, dancing, going, hey, ha ha, you can't shoot me. You know, because if you're, if you're hunting with a gun, you can only shoot that kind of deer. The one with antlers on it. Because that one buck can take care of a lot of does and the herd will continue on. But when you start shooting the does off, no matter how many bucks you have, you're not going to have any young. So they say, 
get rid of all the males there. Get rid of all the bucks. And, and so the buck stays back deep in the woods. There's one time the bucks come out. You know when it is? Mating season. <laughs> he, he, David said, off season? <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> you know, he, they're out there, you know, dancing around for you. But during mating season, and that's the time that they allow hunters to be out there with a gun. Because you know what a buck does in mating season? A buck otherwise never comes out. But in mating season, oh, there's a doe, there's a doe, there's a doe, oh, there's a doe, the doe's over here. Oh, there's a hunter there. Oh, never mind. Does. <laughs> they just are after the doe. And they'll follow that doe for days. And then mate it. And in the meantime, they're probably going to be shot. You know what happens when a deer comes out of the refuge? and it's drawn out, that deer is going to be what? Dinner. No, killed. I want you to catch this picture is what Satan wants to do to you. He wants to draw you out. So he, what did he come to do? He came to steal, to kill, and destroy Jesus came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. But Satan comes and he wants to draw you out so he can destroy you. And whether you're some animal like that or a person, you can be drawn out. Satan wants to do that to you. But look, Scripture is going to warn us. You can be tempted. You can think, I, I can hear somebody saying, ah, I'm not going to be tempted that way. I'm not going to be tempted to do that. I'm not going to be tempted now. Oh, that's not a problem for me. Here's what scripture says. If any man thinks he stand, he stands, let him take heed lest he what? False. When you think that you're not going to be tempted and you're not going to have a problem, he says, ah, Satan's drawing you out already. You're being deceived already. To think that you can stand in the, in the light of that. Four Greek words. The first one is el exelco, and it means to draw out. The second one is deliazo, and it means enticed. And he moves from a hunting term of exelco, to draw out, to a fishing term. Now, I'm not a fisherman, so I don't really know much ab about fishing other than... Uh, you need a license, and you can you know, take your pole in the water, and you use some lures or some bait, and you may, but there's a whole big ocean out there, or there's a whole big lake out there, and, you know, I can only fish right, right about here. So, but he said, this is the term that Satan uses with you. He wants to entice you. Uh, Deliazzo. Here's the way it's worded in James 1, 13 and 14. No one undergoes a trial. No one undergoing a trial should say, I'm being tempted by God. For God is not tempted by evil, and he himself doesn't tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when he is drawn away. That's the first Greek word, right? When he's drawn away. And secondly, when he's enticed by his own evil desires. Got it? And the Greek word again, let me just put it on the screen there, is deliazo. Deliazo means that he's going to entice or lure you or set bait for you so that you're destroyed. Now again, I said I don't know much about fishing, but George Velios, you know George in our congregation? He attends the first service, and he's yeah, in his 80s now. He's actually from Greece. And he came over to the United States on a, a loan from the government of Greece to uh, do flying uh, in Texas. And so and he met his wife, uh, Helen, there. And they, they got married. George is really a wonderful guy. And he says, yeah, I got married. He said, matter of fact, he said, uh, Helen is uh, my, my third wedding ceremony. And people are going, what? What? I thought you were just married to Ellen. Oh, yeah, I was. He said, but we got married in El Paso, Texas the first time. And then we went to Greece 
and got married in a civil ceremony the second time so that we could be married in his country as well as here. And then he said, we went to the church in Greece and we're married a third time. He said, so when we were married 40 years, I tell everybody, I've been married to her for 120 years. Can you believe that? <laughs> I got 40, 40, and 40. Would George, George said to me, hey, would, how about go fishing with me sometime? I said, I, I'm game for that. I don't, where do you want to go, George? He said, well, how about if we go up here in the aqueduct? <laughs> I'm thinking, the aqueduct? What kind of fish are in the aqueduct? You know what? There are fish in there. And so he, we get out of the five or so in the morning, and, and he's got a cart, and it's in the summertime, and he rolls the cart down off uh, 60th Street. We were at 60th Street and came in the aqueduct there. And, and so he starts to get out some, he's got everything there, all sorts of bait and all sorts of nets and all sorts of hooks and lures. And so he says, okay, I'm going to hook you up here and I'm going to get you all set. And he opens up the can where he has his, his bait, his bait that he's going to entice these fish. I said, what kind of fish are in here? He said, oh, he said, you got, you got some, some um, catfish. And they're, you know, these big ones. And, and he said, and he got some, uh, oh, what are the, the kind that suck off the bottom of the carp? You know, the, the, the you know, catfish and carp. So he said, well, we'll do this. You know what he took out for, for bait? Liver. And I'm going, liver? Now, I can, it was chicken liver. And I can, you know, I can, I'm, I'm okay with liver, but most people aren't. And I'm thinking, now, if most people don't like liver, and you're going to give it to the fish, and then you're going to eat the fish, you know, what kind of fish, what is this fish going to taste like? But that wasn't the real thing. You know, because he's saying, he has something else. You know, he had, he had something else that he was going to put on that bait. It's, it's um, this was a number of years ago. And today, what he did is illegal. Now, they've since made it illegal. But at the time, it was okay. Let me come back to that in a second, okay? Here's this lure that we use sometimes for fishing. See that lure? It has no food value and nothing but hooks. Satan comes at us with no real joy of value, lasting value. And he can only, can Satan create anything? Here's what the, the Bible says. Everything was made by the Lord, and without him nothing was made that was made. So who made it all? The Lord. So Satan can't make anything. So Satan can only take what God has made and give it to you with hooks in it. Did you catch that? So George and I are out there with something like this, only in his case, chicken liver. And then, you know, you'll never guess what he put on the chicken liver. Again, it works so well that you can't use it today. But I can't believe that it works so well because it's nothing that I ever want. You know what it is? He sprayed it down with WD-40. <laughs> WD-40, it's a, a lubricant, you know, kind of a, a, an oily, kind of slimy kind of stuff. And he sprayed it down. I caught a wonderful catfish. You know, it was really a big catfish. And I thought, George, I can't believe this. But I took that catfish home, I skinned it down, I put it in aluminum foil, I put it in the oven and then baked it up, you know, 350, 400 degrees, and I thought, oh, this is going to be so good, and, and I I'd put some of the spices in it and everything else. I took it out, it was the nastiest thing I'd ever eaten. <laughs> <laughs> it was so bad, it reminded me of what I learned as a kid. You know what they used to say as a kid when you were like eating carp or stuff like that? They said, you put it on a board, you put it in the, uh, the oven, and you bake it, and then you take it out when it's all done, and you throw the fish away, and you eat the board. <laughs> That's how bad it was. I would say to you, listen, we use these kind of lures and that kind of bait to entice 
something. Now, let me say this. Everything those, the, the fish in the aqueduct, the fish in the ocean, the, the fish in any lake, everything that fish needs is in that water. Is that not true? Those fish aren't going to die because they don't have food. Everything it needs is in there. And we come along with a lure like is on the screen that has no food value and hooks. It looks like the real thing, but it's not the real thing. And we kill it because it swallows the lure and your enticement. And I want you to catch that whether it's the deer being drawn out and killed or the fish being enticed and lured and killed, those are the pictures that God gives us when sin comes after you and your marriage and your kids and your grandkids. And it's going to end in not, nothing good. And he's just warning you. Amos, in chapter 3, verse 5, says this, Does a bird land on a trap on the ground if there is no bait for it? No. You got a trap on the ground, and you, and you put this kind of trap so that they come in for the what? The bait. You're trying to entice them. Uh, does a trap spring from the ground when it has caught nothing? No, it's not going to. And Satan keeps going after us. Let me finish out the second part of this verse. You are enticed by what's the bait that he puts before you. What's the text say? You are enticed by what? Your own evil desires. Did you catch that? That's the bait. That's the chicken liver he puts out for you. Your own desires. Oh, I want this big house. Oh, I want this. Oh, I, I, I want her. Oh, I want... He uses your own evil desires. By the way, look at the screen. Enticed by his own... Look at the screen. By his own... And I'm going to draw that next word. I'm going to just draw a line right through it. Evil desires. Because the word evil doesn't even occur in that text. Now, can I extrapolate and put it there? And I'll tell you how they put it there, why they put it there. Because verse 13, this is verse 14. Was he talking about in verse 13? For God cannot be tempted with What's the word he uses? Evil. Kakos. K-A-K-O-S. God cannot be tempted by evil, neither tempteth he any, every, any man, but each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by what kind of desires would tempt you to sin. Good desires? Do you follow that? So when a translator translated it, he wanted you to know that it was probably evil desires, but here's the Greek word that's used in there. Epithumius, and that Greek word is used for both, for good desires or evil desires. It's only used four times in the New Testament for good desires. Let me give you those four times. The rest of the time, it's evil desires, and that's why they used it evil here. It's used the first time in, in Luke chapter 22, verse 15, where Jesus said when he was with his disciples, I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So when they were having the last supper, Jesus said, it's my desire to, to have this meal with you. That's a good one, right? Jesus is saying, I want to have this time with you. The next time you see it used in Philippians 1.23, he says, I am pressured by both. By both what? Paul says, you know, I can die and be with the Lord. Or I can be here and be with you. Both of them would be wonderful. I be the Lord, that'd be wonderful. And I want to be with you guys, and that would be wonderful. I am press, pressured by both. I have the desire, epithomias, I have the desire to depart and be with Christ. That's a good thing, isn't it? 
for you to want to be with the Lord? Oh, Lord, I want to be with you. I love you so much, I can't wait to be with you. Another time it's used is in 1 Thessalonians 2.17 where he says, but as for us, brothers, after we were forced to leave you for a short time, in person that is, not in my heart, in my heart, I'm still with you. I'm still right there with you. But I, I had to leave you. After I had to leave you for a short time, we greatly, epithomies, we greatly desired and made every effort to return and see you face to face. That was a good thing. I want to be with you. Sometimes you say to your kids, oh, I want to be with you. Hey, can we get together on this day? It's a good thing. The last time it's used is a good thing. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This saying is trustworthy. If any man aspires to be an overseer or an elder, a leader of a church there, he epithumies, he desires a noble work because it's about God's glory. Now, it can be bad. You could have a bad desire to be an elder. The bad desire would be if you want to have, oh, I'm, I'm an elder here, and I want to be and have some authority. And it was about your glory, then it would be a bad thing. But otherwise, it, it's, it could be a good thing. I want to serve God. If I desire to be an, to really function, we say to people all the time, do you want the function of an elder, or do you want the office of an elder? If you want the office of an elder, you say, you walk around and say, well, I'm an elder here, you know. But if you want the function of an elder, you actually have to be functioning as an elder before we can make you an elder. Because God's really made, uh, making you an elder. And so you're functioning, you're teaching, you're giving to hospitality, you're apt to teach, you're the husband of one wife, all those kind of, you meant those requirements. And you're functioning as an elder, and we go, ah, we want to recognize you as an elder. Because you're functioning that way. And if you're not functioning that way, we certainly couldn't make you an elder. If you're not functioning as an elder, how can we all of a sudden make you an elder? You're not doing what an elder does. But if you have that desire for God's glory, that's a good thing. This is 1 Timothy 3. In 1 Timothy 6, verse 9, he uses it in a bad way. Epithumies. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation, a trap, and many foolish and harmful desires. So you know something? If you're poor... You could thank God because you don't have some of the temptation rich people have. You're not buying the wrong things. You're not spending it in the wrong way because you don't have it to spend. The other time it's used is of Satan himself and it's in John chapter 4, verse 44. You are of your father the devil and you want to carry out your father's epithomies. His desires. Are his desires good? No. It's bad. And he said, your desires can get there. Scripture's going to warn you. And what is he saying? Look, here's some Greek words that will paint this picture. Exalco, I want to draw you away so I can destroy you and kill you. The next one, Deliazzo, I want to entice you. And I'm going to use your own desires to do it. And I can hear somebody say, well, wait a minute. Didn't God give me this sexual desire? Didn't he give me this sexual drive? So I ought to, I ought to be able to use it. No, you can use it in the, con in the confines of marriage. By the way, there was a study that um, somebody just was sharing with me. Uh, David, I believe it was you that shared this with me. That the study uh, of um, homosexuals and their involvement. Was it you that shared this with me? And there were... Uh, the studies done by not, not people that were against homosexuality, but by their own group. So their studies showing what they do. And on average, a male homosexual that gets involved with their own desires in a lifetime, on average, their studies have shown that an average male will be involved in more than 550, it was more than that, but more than 550 illicit relationships. That cannot be a good thing. That does not create stability in marriages and families and other people. And oh, but it's their desire. And so what's he going to use to entice us? Our own desire, our own evil desires. And he says, okay, but you can have that sex. God made that sex. I'll give you that sex. But you're going to get it with the hooks in it. Because now you're going to get it with AIDS or venereal diseases or some other thing that's going to destroy you. 
Because when lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. The third word he uses is sulabusa, and it means conceive. So the first thing he does is a hunting one. The second thing he does is a fishing one. The third thing he does is a family thing, conception. Now, conception is really a wonderful and a good thing. But it can, in this case, it can picture something that can also be bad. Picture something that can be bad. Let me show you the verse. No one undergoing a trial should say, I am being tempted by God, for God is not tempted by evil, and he himself doesn't tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when he is, first thing, drawn away. Second thing, and enticed by his own evil desires. Then after, desire has what? Conceived. So what goes on in conception? I mean, that's a wonderful thing. It's, a, it's a, an intimate time between a husband and a wife. It's what God designed to keep creation going. He said, look, this is going to be a demonstration of the love you have for her and the love you have for him. So let me, sh let me say three th two or three things that are pictures of this otherwise very good thing that he's wanting you to see that it can also be a picture of how you get in sin at times. What happens in conception? Apart, f apart for if someone were raped, okay, I'm, I'm setting that aside. Apart from being raped, conception is always voluntary. You want to be close to your husband. He wants to be close to you. You're not fighting your way into that process. Uh, rape, a whole different thing. But otherwise, it's voluntary. How is that a picture of sin? I want you to understand that when you do sin, when you get involved in sin, you're not, going, you're not, you're not saying this, no, no, Lord, no, Satan, stop it. You're going, oh, oh, yes. You're walking voluntarily into that sin. I can hear some of you, if you want to act like you're not voluntarily doing it, you're saying, oh, oh, Satan, I'll give you 30 minutes to quit it some more. Because what do you want him to do? You want, you want it to keep going. You're enjoying that whole thing until the consequence comes down on you. It's a voluntary thing. Secondly, it's a desired thing. Any couple that wants to have children, when they're intimate with each other, what are they? They're desiring what to take place. That they, it, they conceive. The conception takes place. That they're going to have children. So it's voluntary and it's desired that becomes a picture sometimes of our sin. We voluntarily walk into it and we actually desire it. Because what does he use? Our own, what kind of added evil, what? Desires. But it's not only voluntary and it's not only desired, but it takes how many months before that child's going to come out? Nine months? Sin starts in your heart and you conceive it and it germinates in your heart and life. And what do you do? You let it be conceived within you, grow within you, nurture within you so that it can bring forth. What's it say in verse 15? Look at it here. Then, after desire, your desire, your epithumies, after your desire has conceived, it gives birth to what? Sin. So he takes a good picture of conception and lets you say, look, this can be a picture of how sin can get in your life too. You voluntarily let it there, you desire it to be there, or you let it... You nurture it for months until it pulls you down. You conceive this. 
You're going to be tempted. Here are the words that are used, four of them. Excelco means to draw away. Deliazo means I'm going to entice you. Uh, Sulabusa means I'm going to conceive it. So now you've got hunting, fishing, family life. And the last one he says, look what happens. You're going to, get, you're going to swallow this whole nine yard thing. And here's the word, planisthet, it means deceived. Because you have to literally be deceived to accept sin in a wonderful way in your life. I mean, think of what it does to people all the time. They get drunk out of their minds. They smash cars up. They run into people. They kill people's lives when they're drunk like that. And yet people want to go right back out and still get drunk. They, they decide to have extramarital affairs. What was that website that somebody had to, that life is short, have an affair. And then everybody was, the, the names and their, so their um, credit cards and everything were on there. And they started releasing the names and their families were destroyed. And yet they think, oh, let's do this. Why would they want to do that if it's going to destroy everything? You get hooked on gambling, and you think, oh, I, I need to get out of the debt, and you just keep throwing your money away. And the reason those nice hotels exist in Vegas is because people keep throwing their money away, and they can have these nice hotels in Vegas to build on your money. And then you don't have money, and you throw it all away. Why do people? Because they're deceived to thinking that this is a good thing for them. Where does the word deceive come in? Each person, verse 14, each person is tempted when he's drawn away and enticed by his own evil desires. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. Do not be deceived, my dearly loved brothers. King James, do not err. E-R-R. Do not err. Don't, don't be deceived. Don't, don't make an error in your judgment that this is okay to do because it's going to destroy you. It's going to take you down. And when the deer leaves the refuge, it gets killed. When the fish swallow the lure, they die. And he's saying, look, I want to warn you, this is not going to end well. So don't be deceived about it. Let me give it to you in Galatians 6, 7, where he says the same thing. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, he will also reap. Somebody said it to, to me mm, this way years ago. People love to sow wild what? Sow their wild oats. So they sow their wild oats during the week, and then they come to church on Sunday and pray for crop failure. <laughs> oh, Lord, don't let the oats, don't let the oats, come, the oats come out, and, and everybody's going to know. You want to sow your wild oats, but then you want to pray that none of it comes back to roost at your place. Here it is, James 1, 14 to 16. You're drawn away. You're enticed. It gets conceived in you, and then you become deceived. I can think of people that, that used to be around our kids or your kids or here, that today they're so deceived that they think wrong is right and evil is good. what we talked about yesterday. A guy who has a godly family but is so turned away from any of that because he's been deceived. The good news for I have for you as believers is this. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to humanity. God is faithful, and he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But 
with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape so that you'll be able to bear it. And the question I have for you is when you are tempted, will you take or follow or accept his escape plan? And sometimes the best escape plan he's given you are two feet that turns around and says, get out of here. But most of the time, the hook is right there and is ready to pull you down. The question is, do you see the severity of temptation right now? It's going to draw you away. It's going to kill you. He's going to lure you and entice you. It's going to kill you. You've seen family after family after family destroyed by sin. Why would you be so deceived to go back and want to do that? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the warning you give us. <clears throat> thank you for the pictures we have that we can truly understand. Animals drawn out and destroyed. Fish lured away and killed. Father, help us to turn to you and to trust you completely. Would you help us this week as we're tempted, as Satan attempts to lure us or entice us or draw us away again, may we be fixed to you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.